Okay, I just wanted to make sure you, you could hear. Great, okay. Uh, so uh, this talk will be mostly about how to build the RoboV, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how uh, the kind of the motivation behind it. Um, uh, Jim, Jim asked me to talk about that a little bit uh, and, and some of its history. Um, to give you a, oh, oh yeah, and um, I'd like to start off by, um, uh, first of all, thanking my uh, postdoctoral advisor, Professor Rob Wood. Uh, he's really been the originator of this project, and he's been working on it for um, 10 or 12 years by now. Uh, and the work I will talk about is um, actually the work of a whole number of people from his group. And uh, I just want to make sure that, that this is clear. I'm, talking about uh, a lot of people's work, not, not just my own. So I'll start by showing a video uh, to kind of give you a sense of where we're going. This is the current version of the RoboB. Um, and uh, it's about, uh, so there's, there's no sense of scale in this image, but it's about the size and um, weight of a honeybee. And um, it's all manufactured using new techniques um, that I'll describe to you later. Uh, and, it, and it beats its wings at 120 beats per second. So um, on the order of what a honeybee does. Um, so I'll tell you how, how to build that and where we're, where we're going with it. The, um, so the, 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 the kind of the public uh, view we give of this uh, robot is that um, we're thinking about how to make robotic pollinators, um, and so we call them robo-bees. But uh, this was um, motivated a few years ago by uh, observed uh, declines in farmed honeybee populations, um, known as colony collapse disorder. And um, But our goal here is not to, I just want to emphasize this, we don't intend to uh, eliminate bees, we would like to just uh, Potentially serve as a, this could be serve as a backup in the case of uh, kind of a, a biological catastrophe. So, um, but kind of what what, I, what what really gets us interested is more along the lines of uh, the sort of specific advantages you can imagine from a flying robot um, at scale of an insect. Um, and and the way we think about this is we think about how robots like this have advantages over, say, larger robots. For example, you can imagine quad rotors or driving cars. Um, uh, so one of the advantages is they have um, small size. Um, and this leads to dramatically reduced materials cost. Um, another area where they have advantages over larger robots is that they can maneuver in very confined spaces. Uh, as well, um, they're expected to be very maneuverable, much like, um, much like flies and, and bees are. Um, so pollination, getting back to pollination, it's kind of a nice example that we give that uh, combines all of these capabilities. Um, for example, imagine a hive of robotic insects. Um, it need, would need, you'd need a very large number of them to uh, pollinate all the flowers in a large field of flowers. Um, you would need them to navigate through confined spaces and foliage and potentially contend with, with wind as well. So these are um, so robotic bees could potentially solve all of these problems, um, but I want to emphasize um, this is really just kind of a, a, a showcase application. Um, uh, there, I, I believe strongly that there is uh, a lot of roles for robotics in, in particular agriculture, um, and and potentially more promising actually I believe um, is the area of uh, tending. For example, um, you can imagine autonomous robots like this that could seek out um, uh, insect pests uh, of a certain type um, and uh, potentially uh, uh, kill them. Um, and, and we can, and there, uh, there are other tending examples. And you know, I, I'm, I'd be interested. Maybe, um, maybe you guys have some interesting ideas. I would be interested to hear if, if, um, if there's areas like this that that um, could be potentially um, uh, tasks that could be applied, uh, done by a robot like this. Um, so outside of agriculture, uh, some other examples um, include um, 
searching through rubble in disaster areas um, to find trapped survivors. Um, another one I like is um, suppose you have dense piping infrastructure um, from, say, methane gas processing facilities uh, and you have leaks. Uh, something like this is kind of ideally suited because uh, if it were equipped with a smell sensor, it could navigate through airborne plumes and, uh, and potentially find these leaks very efficiently and, and potentially um, thereby reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, so those are some applications, um, but uh, I, I wanted to. So, but what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today is more, more of what we're focused on, which is really how to get these things to work. Um, and maybe at the end we can have a short discussion about um, about um, the, where we could go with them. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you a video of a of a bumblebee to give you a sense of where you know where we'd like to go. Um, so, what this animal does with, I would say, apparent ease, uh, masks a very sophisticated and complicated set of processes. Um, uh, the, the bee flaps its wings at speeds faster than you can, you can see with a, with a human eye. The um, animal has a pair of faceted eyes that perceive the world um, using a visual system completely different from our own. Um, and uh, everything is orchestrated with a, with a brain um, about the size of a, of a sesame seed. Um, so uh, there's a lot of kind of underlying processes here that aren't understood, and so we can kind of see where our research is both um, reverse engineering this and also by, by building an robotic analog, actually potentially learning a little bit about, um, about how insects do what they do. And so this is a kind of, a, I would say, an open, open area of research. So how do you build a robotic version of these? <clears throat> uh, I'll go through a, a series of phases we've, we've, we've kind of progressed through over the, the last 10 or 12 years um, and, and give you a sense of where we are. So th there's a number of facets. Um, the first I'll talk about is manufacturing. Uh, this vehicle needs parts that are built at the size of, a, of an insect. No currently available process is very well suited to this. Um, it needs uh, new designs and vine lines. These are inspired by insects. Um, it needs uh, one of the big challenges was actuation. And, um, and then kind of now we're reaching the, the control part. So the, 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 the real challenge here is that um, Almost nothing is available off the shelf, um, so everything is pretty much handmade. Uh, wings, airframes, actuators. Um, a another challenge is that um, at this scale, the, the physics are quite different from the scale of, from from the physics at a larger scale of, uh, say, airplanes and helicopters. And so this has required um, different approaches. And of course, um, the results look very much like insects, um, and because the, yeah, of course the robot is subject to the same physics as, as insects. Um, so there's a kind of an interesting convergent evolution evolution between robotics and biology. Here. Um, so anything else? Yeah, um, yeah. So that's that's the kind of these are the challenges, and, and and all of these facets have to be designed together at, at the same time. <coughs> so I'll start with manufacturing. Uh, <clears throat> so how do you build parts? If you go, um, if you look at uh, the the very smallest scale, um, there 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 are a number of um, promising technologies derived out of silicon microcircuits, um, and kind of one of the probably most famous at, uh, uh, examples of that is this uh, micro mirror um, ray used in many uh, overhead projectors. I don't know if the one I'm being projected on uses micro-mirror arrays, but it's quite likely it does. Um, and so these technologies are derived from silicon microfabrication uh, of uh, microprocessors. The problem here is that the scale is a little bit too small for insects. The other problem is that uh, silicon actually turns out to be a not a very good property uh, material for making 
flying vehicles because of its toughness and strength to weight ratio. At the other end of the spectrum, we have technologies that have been used to build larger vehicles like exemplified by this uh, blow up of, a, of the parts of a, a Ducati motorcycle. Um, and this is a pretty mature technology, uh, um, but the problem is it doesn't scale very well to the size of an insect. So there's this kind of gap between these two sizes um, that's about the size of an insect that uh, needed to be developed further. Uh, so Rob uh, and um, also with his, uh, his PhD advisor, Ron Fearing at Berkeley, um, basically invented a new process using uh, an ultraviolet laser to cut parts. And in this, in this uh, kind of relatively mature process now, the idea is this laser is UV, so it can cut almost any material, including uh, titanium, carbon fiber, uh, very high performance aircraft grade parts. Um, so la uh, layer, uh, uh, flat materials are cut out and then laminated together to form um, composites. And then after laminating and adhering together, the parts are removed by laser and the released structure has um, flexure joints and this process can build kind of relatively complicated architectural uh, arch are, uh, articulated um, machine elements which are well suited to building robotic insects. So one way we, we, we then assemble parts is by hand. This is kind of the, what we call the traditional way. Um, and so we do this, and the, the scale is small enough that you basically have to do most of it with tweezers and under a microscope. This, um, <coughs> This technology is known as grad student with tweezers. So um, yeah, this is one of the kind of work courses of our lab. But this gives you a sense of how how uh, how it's done. So another approach that that uh, has kind of taken new importance as time has gone on takes inspiration from origami and children's pop-up books. The, the, the idea, the main idea here is that in a, a pop-up book has a single degree of freedom, a single motion as you open the book. And um, in a single motion, everything folds into shape. And that's what informs the, um, this, this particular design. There's one degree of freedom. This scaffold rises up all at once and everything is folded into place in a single step. This is what it looks like. Um, the, the, so again, the, the black material is carbon fiber and these gold colored parts are joints that are bonded by, uh, by solder. Um, and you'll, in a second you'll see the, the pop-up step. So there's, there's pins from below that lift this uh, large scaffolding and through a number of hinge joints the scaffolding folds the airframe of the rubber bead together in a, in a single move. After a re laser release cut, the completed vehicle can be removed from the scaffolding. So that's, that's, okay, oh, I'll let it finish the video. <clears throat> so that's fabrication. Um, the next part I want to talk about is actuation. And again, this um, was met with new challenges that um, are different than larger scale. Uh, seen in larger scale robots, um, so you can you can write up a, a, a slide, uh, uh, sorry, a, a table comparing different kind of technologies in terms of their bandwidth and strength to weight ratio and so on. Um, and after comparing these, one type 
kind of emerges as the, the clear winner, and that's uh, um, electrostatics driven by piezo. So this is what a piezo actuator looks like, and it, um, you know, this is a biomorph actuator. The basic idea is the electric field causes a very small de deflection in the tip of the actuator. Um, and uh, but this has very good strength to weight ratio and is actually quite a bit better than um, electric motors at small scale. So this is what um, the piezo actuators look like. So this um, naturally leads itself to actuating uh, flapping wings rather than propellers. So next I'll get into some design. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, this, this project has been going on for 12 years or so. Um, and it actually started back in um, Ron Fearing's group at Berkeley. So over the, to uh, over the years, um, sort of theoretical studies have given way to um, kind of engineering models and more and more detailed um, simulations and drawings. So this is kind of the evolution of the, kind of the, the visual appearance of the robot. Um, Around right about 2005, they started making actual um, versions that could actually flap their wings. <clears throat> um, around 2007, some, uh, there was a big advance in which the, the, the uh, lift to weight ratio was achieved greater than one, which is to say the wings were able to lift the, the, the piezo and the actuation mechanism. Um, as time has gone on, the, the emphasis has changed in the mechanics from simply generating enough lift to now being able to control the robot as well as generating enough lift. So this design additionally incorporates control actuators that can control the wing kinematics of the vehicle. Um, at the same time, the manufacturing has been um, improving over time as well. So it's hard to see in this picture, but um, the... the uh, Kind of general fidelity of the machining structure has, has, has have been increasing over the, over, the, over the years. So uh, another facet is given the piezos and given the um, fabrication process, how do you how do you generate enough lift? And so we've taken uh, inspiration from flying insects, um, and to illustrate the sort of underlying principle happening for flapping wings. Uh, I, I turned to, I took some videos from some the biological literature uh, and I'll kind of motivate the, the kind of underlying principle by uh, comparing to um, airplanes. So um, if you, if you, if you're flying in an airplane and you, and you pull back, one thing that happens after a certain amount of time is you, you tilt up farther and farther, um, but eventually you find that you lose lift, and this is known as stall. And what's happening there is, um, you can actually see on this wing, as you get steeper and steeper, this leading edge vortex appears at the leading edge of your wing and stays attached at low stall angles, but as you get steeper and steeper, eventually this leading edge vortex detaches and flies out the back of the wing which is shown in this left video um, through bubbles in, in, in mineral oil. This wing is translating. Uh, it's actually an insect wing here, but this, the principle is the same. So a translating wing, it, it, it sees high lift initially after translation, but as soon as that leading edge vortex drops off, the lift drops off dramatically. Um, and so this, this, is the, this underlies the story you might have heard of bumblebees uh, early aerodynamicists claimed that bumblebees cannot fly. Um, and this is because what they did was they put a wing in a linear wind tunnel and translate and blew wind over it in, in the same configuration they saw on a live bumblebee. And the lift was not nearly high enough to, to uh, explain the, the, the ability of the bee to fly. Um, and this was resolved um, I want to say 20 years ago, when um, somebody thought to try to see what happens when the wing is rotating rather than translating. And it turns out there, this leading edge vortex actually remains attached to the wing. 
and so this this additional lift caused by the leading edge vortex um, it accounted for most of the discrepancy in terms of lift um, being seen in, in flying insects. So this is a basic principle. This, um, insects use this unsteady flow phenomenon to, to add to their lift. So the robo bee mimics this um, in its mechanism, and this is this is this is how this kind of on the left shows the the, the, the airframe structure that generates the wing motion, and on the right is a, is a video. Um, so the, one of the innovations here was that early, early designs knew this wing kinematics that, that flies use, or bees, and they built a very complicated mechanism to reproduce this exactly. What Rob's key innovation was, was to Rather than trying to activate actuate that actively, he instead allowed the wing angle of attack, um, this this angle of the wing, to actuate passively on a flexure joint. This vastly simplified the mechanism, but still retained the basic uh, wing kinematics of a fly. And um, this this was enough to vastly reduce the weight and lead to a lift to weight ratio greater than one. Um, and so, just on the left, the, the mechanism here is this triangular actuator is um, is acting as a cantilever, and this tiny motion of the cantilever ampli is amplified through a lever arm to a very large uh, wing flapping activity. So this led to the first videos of a lift greater than weight of over uh, lift to weight greater than one back in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. <clears throat> and this was a nice demonstration that many of the mechanics and fabrication processes were now in place, um, but it highlighted the need for additional capabilities in terms of control and sensing and power. So fast forward a few years, this is what uh, a current design looks like. And the, the, a big difference here is that the two wings are driven independently rather than um, on the same actuator, and this gives you the ability to, to really control the flight of the vehicle. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, this is the video I showed at the beginning. The mass is about the same as a, as a honeybee. So here's a, here's a number of them together. This is the blow up of the, the internal structure. You can see the two actuators here and here. And um, um, yeah, what else? yeah, this is the carbon fiber airframe. <coughs> These yellow parts are the, the flexure hinges. <coughs> the, so as you can see, the, the two actuators drive the two wings independently. As, a, as somebody who moonlights as a fly biologist, when I first saw this video, um, I was reminded of how fruit flies um, do mating with each other by flapping a single wing, or I do, do um, what's the word, mating uh, displays to each other. Another um, um, more recent design is um, to actuate the angle of attack of the wing through a complicated mechanism as shown here. I will skip over the details. In this case, the, the, the second actuator controls through this complicated linkage the, uh, the, the angle of attack of the wings. And uh, flying flies and bees are believed to be able to actuate the angle of attack uh, potentially in a similar way. So I'll skip forward a little bit to flight control now. So what I'll, what I'll start doing is showing you what happens with our with the rubber bee with no flight control first. And um, it's actually unstable, and it happens very quickly, so um, don't blink. Uh, hopefully the video comes through the, the internet. So 
here it goes. So this is with no feedback. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really look like the B I showed you at the beginning, does it? So I'll show it in slow motion now. Again, this is no feedback. This is just flapping the wings and open loop. So what this highlights is that in addition to being able to generate enough lift, the RoboBee needs uh, actuation and control. And um, <coughs> this also is the case for flying insects as well. So this is an example of the sort of thing that insects do in a way that is effortless to us, but it's clearly an issue evolution had to contend with and that we're just now kind of discovering as we build uh, robotic equivalents. So we built, uh, the first way we decided to try to control this is to build a flight arena in which the um, uh, cameras were, uh, could record the position and orientation of the vehicle. with something like this. This is a flight arena in real life. These are the cameras above. Uh, white reflective markers are attached to the RoboB to, to track its position and orientation. And this is a, a US quarter for scale. Okay, so that's the sensor. So to do feedback control, feedback control 101 diagram, uh, we need a sensor and we need um, an actuator. So in the case of the RoboB, for example, by flapping one wing with a larger amplitude than the other, this can control the, the uh, roll motion or, or uh, there's another wing kinematics to generate pitch motion. So between these two and a clever feedback controller, we can generate um, a, a controller that cause it to fly. So after a large amount of head scratching and thinking and controller tuning, you can get something that looks like this, which is a Ruby now flying um, under computer control, stably in the air. We had the great honor to uh, be one of the few um, robotics papers to uh, be published in science for this. Um, so we were quite enthused about having this big step <laughs> and I'll play this in real time. This is what it looks like in real time. So while this was great, we, we quickly realized that, uh, uh, as you know, there's a large number of cameras around this vehicle. Um, this vehicle is actually flying blind, it has no sensing um, on board, and so um, it really is not possible to do this kind of flight in lab uh, or anywhere outside of this very specific lab conditions. Uh, so um, I've been, uh, this, this kind of gets into a little more of my work, which is to add uh, sensors on board. And so the, the main requirement here is that the sensor has to be super lightweight and require very low processing capability. Um, so the first thing we considered was this uh, insect inspired of Selly. So if you look at the um, heads of most flying insects, in addition to the compound eyes, they have these three light sensors on the top of the head that uh, are diffuse and are believed to help with um, attitude stabilization. So we built a, a uh, insect inspired of Selly that has four light sensors and attached it to the top of the vehicle. The idea of the light sensor, uh, the Ocelli, um, in, in our case, was consider there's a light source above the vehicle. As this Ocelli sensor rotates back and forth, these two light sensors gather more or less light. You can use a feedback control model of the aerodynamics of the vehicle to show that with a simple feedback control law, you can actually make the vehicle stay upright in flight. So this is what it looks like in flight without any sort of feedback, as, as I've shown before. Um, now if you add the Ocelli and this feedback, simple feedback control law, you can actually get the vehicle to stay upright during, during short flights. And one of the cool things is that this is a 
an example of using the RoboV to test a hypothesis about how bees stay upright in flight. So bees, as you may know, don't have the gyroscopic sensory organs of flies. Um, so it's actually a mystery how they stay upright in flight. Um, and so what our results suggest was that they actually could use their ocelli to duplicate their, their um, gyroscopic ulterior function that's seen in flies. Um, we've also attached uh, light sensors to the, uh, sorry, um, optic flow sensors to the vehicle to show that this is kind of the next step. Uh, this is a camera. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very simple demonstration, but it shows that we're now getting higher resolution cameras on board. And uh, in addition, this is a you know, gyroscope from a mobile phone. Because of pressure from the consumer electronics industry, these have now become small enough now to fly on board a RoboB as well. So this flight shows a flight in which the, the, the gyroscope gives feedback about the attitude of the vehicle, that is the orientation, and then uh, external motion capture cameras are only giving the um, position of the vehicle. Um, so, yeah, so with that, I think I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip a few slides and just jump to the end because I think we're running out of time. And I'll go to this slide. So, uh, yeah, so I think um, I just wanted to say that um, I think we're just getting started on this. Um, and there's a we, 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 so I've shown you that we, we, we've got some of the basic parts in place in terms of sensing and control. Uh, we don't have computers on board. We don't have batteries on board. Um, so there's really a lot to be done. And one of the real kind of open areas is how to do to, to replicate the brain functions of, of these animals. Um, and this is a, one of the areas I'm very interested in. Um, and another question is, what do you what do you do once you have these, and what are the implications for society? And I, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I, this is not uh, my area of particular expertise, um, um, but this is a, I think, I guess I would just say, like any sort of new technology, particularly in robotics, um, I think it's important to have a discussion about uh, potential positive and negative uses and uh, to keep the public informed and to potentially consider um, appropriate legislation. And um, so I think, I think this is kind of going to be an ongoing discussion of where, 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 um, where these will, will see application. Um, so with that, I will um, conclude and thank our funding agencies and, um, and open the, uh, the floor to questions now. Thank you.